Aloha. Welcome to Condo Insider. This is our weekly show about association living every Thursday at three o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. And they're running a campaign and they're a wonderful nonprofit supporting the public interest. And we encourage you to go into Think Tech and consider making a donation. We've been on this show now, I think this is over 160 episodes we've done about association living. And as I've said before, about 38% of our population lives in an association. And thank you for tuning in today. I've asked a good friend of mine, David Simpson, to join me, who's a director at Associa Hawaii, to talk about something at, at that time of year again, whether we like it or not, called budgets and reserve studies just to kind of review the statutory requirements and kind of current thinking on budgets and reserves. And so I asked David, who I've known for a long time to come in. Welcome David to the show. Thank you, Richard, I appreciate it. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience a little bit, who you are, how long you've been in Hawaii, okay. you know? Well, uh, I've been in Hawaii now for about, I hate to say this because it really will date me, but 25 years, um, but I've loved every minute here. And I've spent about the last 20 years somehow involved with properties, be it association management, commercial properties, and different types of real estate. Do you like the real estate industry? I do. You know, every day is a new, exciting day. I guess we can sum it up by saying. I usually tell everybody I like it because it drives me to drink. <laughs> but, but then it's a short drive. You're right, right? And it does do that, too. So test your patience at the time, particularly residential management because boards of directors uh, take a lot of pride and uh, personal interest in the place they live and become emotional about it at times. So it's not an easy job, I've been told. So. Yeah, but I think uh, it's very gratifying because at the same time, it is personal for them. And hopefully, um, we're helping them out with you know, any aspect of, of their lives. With them, you know? And we, we really can, can create some good relationships. Well, it is their home, and they, they, they need to care about their home. And we thank volunteers on boards uh, for taking the time to serve in this job that doesn't pay very well. True. Because the law says they get nothing. Yeah. A grief. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we thank them for that. And uh, but the law is very clear. You know, the associations every year have to do a budget. Right. What yeah. do you think about that? You know, I think it's fiscally responsible. I think it's, I think it's you know, a good standard. And the law basically, correct me if I'm wrong, um, although the last time I was wrong was 1964. I there think. you go. No, no, that's not. But anyway, um, the, the law is pretty clear that there are certain items that have to be in the budget. Let's just assume for the purpose of our, our show today, we're talking about an association with a calendar year budget. January 1 to December 31. Okay. There are associations out there that have fiscal year budgets where the fiscal year might end on May 31 or June right, 30th right. or whatever. But uh, to keep this simple, we're going to be talking in terms of, uh, of January 1 to December 31. So by law and by their governing documents, they have to do a budget. Right. What, what's included in the budget? Well, you know, there's several items. Um, I mean, they have to have a an estimate of the revenues, um, expenses. We're, we're looking at, you know, if it's going to be a cash or an accrual basis. We've got um, a total revenue, or the reserve account, sorry. Um, an estimate of reserves uh, and, and an explanation of how those reserves were calculated realistically. So we know that we're doing everything in a proper fashion. Um, the reserve contributions, you know, per the reserve study and, or, and a percentage of the funding or if it's a cash flow aspect. Well, you know, I've been in this industry 25 years or more. The term I've always hated was maintenance. Right. Because people think of maintenance fee, they think of maintenance. And more times than not today, the fee you pay is more of an operating fee. It is. Because you're going to have water, sewer, that's not maintenance. You may have TV cable or internet in some cases. In some cases, you might hire security for your building. You certainly have insurance. Which if you're in a flood zone, there's flood insurance, liability insurance, property insurance. Right. So the maintenance fee, I've never liked that because people seem to think when they get an increase every year that why should 
Why should we have an increase? I haven't seen much maintenance being done here. What's your experience? Well, you know, when we, when we look at increases, you know, especially here in Hawaii, things are going to go up. Prices are going to move forward, and, and we've got to, we've got to be prepared for it. You know, and realistic, a, a budget is proactively looking at the future costs, even within that 12-month period. Well, the issue becomes to me, you know, budgets today under Hawaii law and current association thinking, what they call zero-sum budget. Mm -hmm. We look at how much money we need, how much money we need to put in reserves by statute. That comes up to some number. We multiply it by the percentage of common interest for every owner, mm -hmm. and that becomes their association fees. Right. Some clients break it out to reserve contribution versus the uh, maintenance fee, or uh, technically under the law, it's called a regular assessment. But, mm -hmm. uh, they break that out. And what happens if someone doesn't pay? If an owner's delinquent? You well, know, I mean, those are the parts that we, we are unable to plan for, I guess you could say, because I think we're always hopeful that everybody's going to pay and they're going to pay on time. Um, but it definitely can create a shortfall. So what should associations do? Should they have a vigorous collection policy or should they? I think it's very important that they set a standard and then adhere to that standard. Um, especially when you're talking a larger association, it's just pure numbers, right? The more, the more individual um, units you have, the more likely you could have someone that doesn't pay in the same manner that everyone else does. The worst I've ever seen was going back to I want to say 2008, yeah. we had the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. I had a project on Maui of about 60 units, mm -hmm. mostly vacation rentals and investor units. And that particular association was leasehold. And they had just finished an agreement to buy from the lessor, the fee for around 17 million, this oceanfront property in Kanapali. And on top of that, they had deferred maintenance. They had borrowed another two and a half for the reserves to fix the spalling and the deck or whatever it may be. I can't remember everything. Right, right. Time. And what happened was because with the economy changing and people not coming to Hawaii and tourism down, yep. they weren't getting the revenue. And 30% of the condominium units walked away from the units, leaving. 30% of the units uh, not paying maintenance fees. Use, I hate the word maintenance fees, exactly. but I'm going to use it in the show. That's what everybody, <laughs> kind of like, might as well go with the flow. That's what right. everybody uses. What do you think about that? You know, I mean, it's, it's detrimental, you know, especially to the, to the property uh, because the costs are still going to be there. We, we know that. As we said, if we want to call them operational costs or we want to call them maintenance costs, they're still there. So then you, it ends up being troublesome for the, all the individuals that have made their payments. Well, in this case, we didn't know the financial crisis. Right. Their whole theory was they'd borrow the $17 million. Each of the 60 owners would go out and borrow uh, the money they needed, which is about 300000 an owner, I think, mm -hmm. a little less. Um, but they would go out and borrow the 300000 pay off the $17 million bank loan. And they'd have a fee simple property on the ocean. The problem was in 2008, because of the crisis, all the real estate values plummeted. They no longer had the equity in their unit. So the banks wouldn't give them individually the loan to buy the fee, which meant the association had to pay the bank loan of 17. But then 30% weren't paying their maintenance fees. So believe it or not, they were in default with the bank. That was a major crisis. It took them about 10 years to get out of it. But understand this, even though the banks have no mortgage on the property, they have an assignment of cash flow for the mm -hmm. maintenance fee. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to foreclose. What are they going to do with it? Right. So they did a workout where the interest was reduced to like one quarter of 1%, interest only. They did a workout while the association could go through the foreclosure process get the units and resell them, and maybe the original lender uh, for the individual owner's mortgage got uh, was stuck because they didn't get what they should to pay off the balance. Right. But over a few years, it worked itself out, and now all those units are worth more, and all the people are fee simple, and 
I think it took about 10 years for the last unit to be sold and, and conveyed, but what happened was that the banks were very, very um, accommodating to find a workout plan to keep the association afloat. Right. What that association did with the remaining 70% of the owners, they passed a monthly cash flow assessment. And that was strictly to cover the 30% of the people who weren't banks. And then as they got new units in or whatever, they would adjust that cash flow assessment. And that's how they made up the deficit. Although not a recommended budgeting strategy. No, <laughs> no, it, but definitely a recoverable one. Recoverable. So how often do they do a budget? Annually, right? Annually. And do you know offhand what the legal requirement is when they have to have the budget done by? Well, so the way that works is they've got to have, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, as, as we said earlier, um, 30 days before their annual meeting is when it's required. That is the statutory obligation, but assuming the annual meeting's in April and the budget year is December 31, okay. um, most associations would adopt the budget in, let's say, November, mm -hmm. so they give the 30 days mandatory notice of any increase in maintenance. If there is no increase, they don't have a 30-day obligation. But used more often than what I tell clients all the time is that if you want to put a budget out to your owners, you can't prove that it's actually correct. Right. If you're getting near the end of the year and you have issues on your reserves and funding the Lanai deck, whatever it may be, and you have big numbers that are missing, mm -hmm. are you not better off adopting last year's budget for the beginning of the next fiscal year, January 1, mm -hmm. and then amending that budget March or April, once you have real numbers. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great pathway. So, the message on that is, by the way, is, is that budgets are not set in stone, although not recommended. You could amend your budget every year. So, in the middle of the year, I saw an association that uh, lost a lawsuit on a, I want to say sexual harassment or whatever by one of the employees. They got a multi million dollar judgment that this was covered by insurance. Well, they needed to borrow money and do some things, and what they did is they amended their budget in the middle of the year, and they got a loan, and they solved it. So right. budgets, even though they're due, there's nothing in the statute to prevent you from amending your budget or reserve study. And do you want to put out a budget reserve study you can't depend on versus taking a couple extra months to really hone on, on the real numbers so you know what the, what the costs are? Yeah, I, th I think it's imperative, really, to take those extra moments. So anyway, we're getting close to a time for a quick break here. So we're going to take a one-minute break. We'll be back with David Simpson about budgets and reserves in a minute. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off. And so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. ハワイ Welcome back to Condo Insider. I'm sitting here with David Simpson, a director with Associate Hawaii, talking about the basics of doing budgets and reserve studies. We're taking on that topic today because we're going into budget season and all these associations out there are going to be pulling their hair, drinking more wine, whatever, trying to figure out how not to raise the maintenance fees, recognizing that's an impossible task and a poor choice of strategy because, as we discussed earlier, it's a zero-sum budget. You're collecting just enough money to pay your bills and fund your reserves. And every year, things go up, like insurance, your employees want more money, medical insurance for your employee, all these different costs, water, sewer. So there's always inflationary pressure on the budget. And 
simply reducing reserve contributions is like the old Fram oil filter commercial, pay me now or pay me later. You're gonna end up with not enough money in reserves ultimately, which may require a special assessment or a loan. When we finished up, we were talking about the basic obligations of a budget, and you have to do them annually, and uh, if you're not quite sure the numbers you have until 30 days before the annual meeting, uh, before the final budget is due, and even that final budget can be amended later during the year. So that's kind of where we were. So yes. let's talk about reserves for a couple. Okay. I've said in the beginning that you do the operating costs, which are like the monthly costs, maintenance, salaries, whatever it may be. What is a reserve study? What, what is basically its purpose? So realistically, it's to evaluate anything $1,000 or over, generally speaking. But over a 20-year period, you want to get a good idea of life expectancy of, of major components. I think that this goes back, and I can tell you some history, that when you know, condos are interesting entities. You know, in some cases, people have incorporated because they think they need that additional protection of being a corporation. But condos are created by statute. Mm. And they exist because of statute. The statute provides those unincorporated condominium associations all the protection that a corporation has just by being a statute. So once you get into uh, doing a budget or a reserve study, what happened in the 70s were developers wanted to sell the units. So they made the maintenance fees really low with no money for the future roof or the future painting or anything else, <coughs> excuse me. And so what happened is the legislature back in around 1995 or 96, huh? passed a law saying that you must do a reserve study and be 50% funded by January 1, 2000. And that's kind of where it began because the idea behind it was so many people were complaining they bought in a senior citizen and there was a $10,000 roof assessment or painting assessment that they felt that condos should disclose up front through a reserve study what the future uh, repairs are going to be required, and an estimate what the costs were going to be, right. and require everybody to put in monthly a contribution towards that. Mm -hmm. The idea behind it is if the project was brand new and the painting was going to last 10 years, and that was $10,000 or 1000 a year, and you lived there for five of those 10 years, you should be paying 50% of your prorated reserve because right. you use, in theory, half the painting for the building. And it was a forced method to, to deal with that. Now, the problem with that was January 1, 2000. It was amended in 1997. I know that because I wrote the amendment. There we go. So I can speak without fail, about, without error on this in the infinite wisdom of our legislature, they gave you a choice of, at that time, of percent funded as the only method to fund your reserves. Mm -hmm. And like cash or accrual accounting, there are different techniques you use to calculate percent funded versus cash flow reserves. And if you look at the administrative rules that support the law, and if you guys don't know there's administrative rules out there, there are rules out there that tell you specifically how you have to calculate a long story, it's a whole show in its own room. But anyway, when they passed the law, they said you have to use percent funded. Mm. Failing to recognize one small fact, 99.9% .9 of the industry didn't use cash flow funding. Right. They use, or excuse me, not percent funded. They didn't use percent funded, they used cash flow funded, which is a different calculation technique, which is a more balanced technique. So anyway, making a long story short for my question, but I don't even see if there's a question in here. But anyway, that they, they put the reserves to the obligation to make sure the consumer was protected, that there was a reasonable opportunity that association was collecting from the owners as they used these components, mm -hmm. uh, enough money to pay for their replacement. And it wouldn't be a surprise to everyone. That's kind of the history. There you go. So from your experience, what's your experience with these? You know, are they I, useful? Are they, no, I think they're very useful. You know, I think it, as we move forward, 
for the construction. We're seeing, you know, from years and years ago, we don't see uh, some of the larger items that we see today. So, you know, now we've got elevator remods, and we've got all these things that are multiple sometimes um, that we need to be able to calculate and plan for. It's really about the plan. And if the plan is wrong, is the board responsible? Can they be sued personally? Well, the, the, I, think, I think the question really becomes is, were they doing their fiduciary duty? Did they make a, a valid attempt? I think that's really more of the question. Yeah, I think, yeah, and they expand upon that, is that the statute gives them immunity, provided it was done in good faith. Right. So if they've really done some work on that, they made a mistake or they forgot something, they're probably not going to be sued personally. I had a case. I was a, in this case as an expert, where the board said, you know, we have to replace the air conditioning. Mm -hmm. Our reserves are in great shape. We just pretend the air conditioning system doesn't exist. We don't put it in reserve. Now the question becomes, if they did that, which I did not let them do that, by right. the way, if they did that, and all of a sudden there's an assessment, would they have protection under the statute if they couldn't be sued personally, if they willfully and intentionally excluded a component that they knew was there? I would have to think that, you know, they're going to hold some responsibility for that. I think that they would. Yeah. You know, that's not what happened, but I was involved early in this case and in trying to correct some prior reserve study issues. Hmm. And the issue was, they were like, well, we, we're in great shape. We've got lots of money if we don't have to take care of the air conditioning. Well, what if you do have to take care of the air conditioning? Well, you're going to have to take care of it eventually. And by the way, it's not working now, so I don't know how you say it's going to have a long life. You know? And uh, it's funny, because I was recently in another case, and um, they had me in uh, my deposition, and they were saying, well, why do you think this reserve study is inappropriate? An example I gave is one, but many examples was that the building was 40 years old when they did a condo. Okay, so the components were already 40 years old. Right. They had wood fire doors, and their old reserve study, not mine, which here I say not mine, said, "Well, we're going to replace one fire door every five years." So there's 52 fire doors. That means it's going to take 260 more years, or a total of 300 years replace all the fire doors. Now, is that something you can say in good faith makes sense to you? Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I think they might, uh, the life expectancy on a door was not gonna be 260 or 300 years. No, it's not. And so, I think you have to say to board, look, when you get these reserve studies, you, you have a degree of immunity, but you have to put some good faith effort into that, and modern thinking, would tell you if you have something like wastewater pipes that has this unknown useful life and there's so many factors of whether the pipes are exposed or are buried within the concrete. There's, there's so many factors that affect useful life that at least, as the statute and the administrative rule says, put it in the reserve study. And even if you put a footnote saying, we don't know the remaining life of this, that we're funding it at $50,000 a year until more data comes in uh, so it can be more appropriately published. Do something versus right. pretend it doesn't exist in the, in the scheme of all this. So, what's your advice to boards in the budget? So, first and foremost, make sure it's done, and make sure it's done timely, properly. I think the time you put into your budget, it will pay for itself. You. Know, you you got it, like you just said a few minutes ago, it's all about making sure everything's there. Because those are the knowns, and what we can't do sometimes is budget for the unknowns. Do you know offhand whether the statute says you have to hire a professional to do the reserve study, or can the board do it? So I'll be very transparent here and say I'm not positive, but I would have an expectation that you should have some type of professional training to be able to conduct something that's so important. Well, it's interesting because the statute itself does not specifically 
require the board to hire a third party professional, although it's recommended right. for all the reasons you just cited. Because you have to understand a condo world, you have two unit condos and thousand unit condos. Mm -hmm. So a board of a 10 unit condo with uh, maybe it's a uh, single family homes of its CPR, all they have is street lights and a road. It's not that complex that they should have right. to hire a professional. The statute, uh, the statute typically is a broad brush. It, it doesn't carve out the two versus the thousand unit project. Although there are issues in the statute where they talk about units less than 20 units for certain issues. But the reality of it is nothing in the statute requires you to. But the question is how do you do a good job planning if you don't have a reserve study? And you know what the best part of hiring a professional to do a reserve study is? I would say if, you, if it's wrong, it's their fault. That's right, you've transferred the liability, even though that professional is not liable, because it's still a budgeting tool, it's not science. Right. You don't know exactly how long it's gonna last. But you know, if you get a good professional and they work with you while you're doing your operating budget, you can put together a very high quality product that gives you a reasonable chance of having money when, when, the, when the money is due. Right. And uh, uh, I would tell you, I've been doing this a long time. It's not perfect under any set of But what makes it more perfect, close to perfect, mm. is a board will simply put the time and energy with their management company and or their hired professional to think about every component, every issue, and try to put some basis in a reserve study. And then in that reserve study, the most important word I teach when I teach this is disclosure. Put some sentence in what your assumptions were right. so you have that basis. I was actually in another lawsuit recently, I guess still going on, where the reserve study was done and they projected $50,000 for falling repair. And they had bids of 650000 Does that make sense to ignore the bids? from? No, it doesn't. Anyway, we're down to one minute in the show. So I want to tell you it's always great to have David on my show. I always enjoy hanging out with you. Thank you. More fun to drink wine with you than to sit here in this, this uh, beautiful home here and, uh, and uh, talk about business. But either way, we're going to have another great show next week. You've probably met my other co-host, Cheryl Franklin. And Jane Sugimura, I will not be here next week. I'll be going off to California as a guest speaker at a major owner conference of management companies. Talking about an exciting topic. I hope it's exciting. I better figure out what I'm going to talk about. Anyway, well, thank you for watching Condo Insider. We hope you've learned something about budget reserves and, and are going to plan accordingly if you're a board member. And if you're an owner, understand why maintenance fees occasionally go up. So thank you for watching Condo Insider. Thank you.